So uh, I think it's the introduction principle. Um, my name is Lindsay Homewood. I'm going to be talking about uh, burning down silos. And it's sort of more of a technical introduction to what DevOps is from a technical perspective and how we can implement that. Um, there's a lot, a lot of content in this talk. You can think of it as like a lump of coal that I'm slowly compressing into a diamond. So without further ado, um, it's all about DevOps, right? Uh, and I'm not really focusing on the sort of airy-fairy business stuff within DevOps. DevOps, I'm looking at the hard technical stuff behind it, the way that you actually go about implementing this within an organization. And we're doing this, I'm looking at it from the perspective of a case study, um, all about applying that, uh, applying DevOps principles with technology. Um, in this particular case, we're, we're talking about a high-profile fundraising website that runs in the month of November. And uh, there's strong siloization. So the dev and operations teams are, are not only like, completely separate, but they're actually in completely different companies. So it makes things, it amplifies a lot of these DevOps problems. Uh, and the last thing here is we have a 100% uptime business requirement for the duration of the campaign. So I'm going to go to three concepts that I'm going to keep on referring back to throughout this talk. So those concepts are consistency, repeatability, and visibility. So I'm going to go through those quickly now. So consistency, well, what is consistency all about? It's about ensuring identical behavior within an environment or across multiple environments. So in a typical HA website environment, you're going to have multiple, multiple stages, I suppose, where you're deploying the application to, and it's got to be promoted through those before it can get up into the production site. So it's vitally important that there is consistency across each of those environments um, so that you know that if something works in one environment, then it's going to work exactly the same in the other environment. So technology-wise, we're looking at configuration management here uh, and a whole bunch of testing, whether that's manual testing or automated testing. So Puppet uh, is my configuration management system of choice. Actually, interesting idea. Who, who here has used Puppet before? Put your hands up. OK, fantastic. So that's about 50% of the room. So I'll do a really brief introduction to it, and then I'll sort of move more to the, um, the low-level technical stuff. Uh, it becomes a bit more difficult when you are managing large Puppet installations. So um, Puppet is a language for describing how you, uh, how you want your machines to be configured, a library for applying that configuration to a machine, uh, and a client and server for distributing that configuration around. I'm going to keep speaking. Is it better? Not hearing any of that feedback anymore? Better? Better? Cool. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> cool. There we go. <laughs> I'll just talk a lot quieter. So uh, this is an example of Puppet Manifest, the programming language that you use to, to configure your systems. So up here we're saying that, uh, does this work? Yes, it does. So we're saying here that we want the uh, Apache 2 package to be installed on the machine, uh, and we want the Apache 2 service here to be, to be running. Uh, and generally, you'd wrap that in a thing called a class, which is just a way of grouping similar bits of configuration all together. Uh, and you can think of it as sort of like a building block, um, as you know, like, like a Lego building block, I suppose. Um, and a traditional Puppet workflow that pretty much everyone uses is they write their manifests, they apply those manifests to a machine, and then they debug them, because you probably never get anything right the first time. Good example of that, if we go back to uh, the class that we were looking at just a second ago, um, Puppet is declarative. so. You can't guarantee that when you write something in a manifest that it'll be executed in the order that you've written it. So, for example, there are cases where that Apache service will try and be started before the uh, Apache 2 package is installed on the machine. So what you do is you set up an implicit, uh, sorry, an explicit requirement of the service onto the package. And that's sort of like Puppet, uh, Puppet Relationships 101. And this starts getting very, very complex when you have lots and lots of manifests in your environment. So in this particular case study that I'm talking about, we had uh, about 137 manifests that described all of the different things in our environment. So there's a lot of complex relationships there. Um, the other thing that can muck things up sometimes, uh, in a commercial environment at least, is the dependence on proprietary software. You know, you might be getting a database from a vendor or maybe some sort of application service from a vendor. And quite often, proprietary software is not conducive to being automated. So it means you spend lots and lots and lots of time debugging. So you get really familiar with that, uh, with that testing lifecycle that I was talking about a second ago. Um, a good way that we found to get around this was VMware snapshots. You can do snapshotting with whatever virtualization stuff you're using, but you basically take a snapshot of the system before you make any changes, apply those changes, didn't work, okay, revert. Um, things start getting a bit more complicated as well when you have these multiple deploy environments because you've got to maintain consistency between all these different environments, right? So one problem that you can have is configuration drift, where if you don't 
uh, I suppose, group the configuration and parameterize it to, uh, well enough, uh, you end up with a lot of duplication across your different environments because you've got your stage environment, your production environment, your ad environment. You might want to make a change in stage and then make sure that it, uh, you want to make sure that it applies cleanly to all the other environments as well. So one little abstraction that we came up for this was a concept of a role, uh, and it's just built using uh, Puppet Defines, so the sort of like parameterized classes. Um, so this is an example uh, define that we've got here, or example role, sorry. So uh, we've just got an app server role, uh, and we're saying that it's, it's got a base server configuration, Apache 2, MySQL, blah, blah, blah. We've got a bunch of different options that we pass into it as well. And that's really important because up in the nodes, the, the node configuration files, um, it's very obvious to see the data that's being passed around to Puppet. Like one of the one of the common patterns of Puppet is that you just have a whole bunch of classes that you apply to a node, and then you've just got these you know these variables that are just floating around in the global namespace, and that introduces lots and lots of problems. So using roles like this is very explicit what you're passing through to all these different components, uh, and you reduce a lot of duplication there as well because you're using the same app server uh, role across your staging and production environments. The next thing as well that's really cool um, is just regex matches in the node names. So it meant that basically with this configuration, no, it's a problem, you can't really see it all that well. Oh well. Um, so with the regexes, uh, you, you basically, you don't have to write a new node block for every machine that, um, that you're adding into the cluster um, because Puppet already knows the configuration for it. And using that, we're able to get down to close to 30 minute builds for any of our, uh, for any of our application servers when we needed to add them to the cluster. Um, so that sort of rounds out consistency there. Um, the next thing here is repeatability. And the question that you're probably asking yourself now is, how is repeatability any different to consistency? Well, repeatability is really a function of consistency. It's all about automating to remove human error and increasing speed by shortening feedback loops. So a really good example of that is automated deployments, automated application deployments, and configuration management it goes hand in hand with that. So for application deployments, we're using Capistrano. Um, Capistrano is a Ruby DSL around SSH in a for loop. The sysadmins in here will probably be groaning inside a tiny bit right now. It's simple, powerful, and it will blow your legs off if you don't use it properly. Um, and that's really, that's actually a big problem with the simplicity of it. It provides a whole bunch of sort of base constructs and you can chain them together to do arbitrary things. And uh, it's very, very easy to put too much automation, try to do too much with your Capistrano tasks. So it's not a substitute in any way for configuration management. You should be using Capistrano to automate the repetitive tasks, but using it basically to trigger off something else that does that, does that task. So for application deployments, um, the particular application that we were dealing with was PHP. So we're using a thing called Rails, Rails List Deploy, which is a, a plugin for Capistrano. What it does is it removes a whole bunch of the Railsisms that, uh, that come with Capistrano. Capistrano works, uh, was, was designed around working with Ruby on Rails. Um, but it makes it absolutely fantastic for using with PHP applications. Uh, the next thing that we used as well was Capistrano multi-stage, and this is the really, really cool part of Cap. Um, so if you look here at the stages, the first four lines are pretty standard Cap configuration, but the last part is really interesting that you get with Cap multi-stage. So what we're doing here is we're saying that we've got three different stages that we're going to be deploying to. We've got UAT, staging, and production. So there's a configuration file for each of those. So it means that you can apply customizations to each of those stages. So if this one here is for the staging one. We're saying that we've got two app servers and one static server. And then for the production, we've obviously got different names of the servers that we're deploying to. Um, and, uh, and there's an extra application server here. Um, and then when it comes to actually deploying to each of those environments, what you do is you go, if you're right. You go cap, uh, and then the environment that you're deploying to, and then deploy. Uh, and so for this particular case, you'd be doing cap staging deploy. And that will require all the information from the staging environment and only, only talk to the staging environment for doing that deploy. And then you test it and go through normal QA and all that sort of thing. And then you've got cap production deploy, which again will do exactly the same thing, but for the production environment. Uh, and campus running behind the scenes also requires a tiny bit of bootstrapping as well for it to just work. You can't just go, okay, I've, you know, I'm going to capify my application and then I'm just going to deploy it. Cap expects certain directories to be in certain places, certain users to exist, that sort of thing. So that's the configuration management side of things here, where we're basically automating as much of that as, as possible so that we can fire up an app server and just have this all work. So really, really simple. I'll just run through this quickly. Um, we've got a deploy and a, a deploy user and a deploy group, um, which is what the deployment uh, is being done through. So the, the machine is, so the user is just SSHing, sorry, cap is just SSHing into the machine as a deploy user. And we've also got a bunch of SSH keys here as well. So all the, de uh, all the deployments are passwordless. 
And then on top of that, we've got a Capistrano site. And this, these are the configuration, uh, sorry, the directories that I was talking about a second ago. So we're making sure that um, uh, a, bit, yeah, a bunch of different directories exist that depend on one another. Um, and there's a, like a, a place for logs and a place for configuration files and all that sort of thing. So this is the interesting part here, um, where we can basically go, you know, Capistrano site, charity.com. And we're applying it uh, to all the app servers. And the awesome thing about this is that you can do multiple Capistrano sites for a single machine. Um, so that provides all the infrastructure and does all the legwork for you behind the scenes. And that makes applying to your new application server as easy as taking the existing configuration and adding a new line. It's all done, it's all there, it's all ready for the developers to go and do whatever they need to do. Or you can even refactor it into something maybe a tiny bit more simple. So you can just you know, increment a number basically and it'll just work magically for you. So you don't have all, that, all those extra lines of configuration there. Okay, uh, next thing on the, uh, on the automation stuff, uh, Git SVN mirror. So why Git SVN? Well, to give you some background here, the repository, the application itself that's being deployed is 182 megs in size because there's a whole bunch of static assets that are in there as well. So we've got 182 megs of application being deployed to 20 application servers, and the data center is in Sydney, and the SVN server is in Melbourne. So that's a lot of traffic that's got to go every single time you want to do a deployment. So Capistrano has a little thing built in called Remote Cache. And what that does is on each of the application servers that you're deploying to, uh, it keeps uh, a, an SVN checkout on, uh, on a random bit of the, uh, the disk. Uh, and when you actually do a deploy, it's just doing SVN up in that checkout. Uh, and then it just copies the repository across. It's using copy. It's not doing a clone or anything like that. Um, the problem with that is that it doesn't work particularly well with SVN tags, and SVN tags are a fundamental way to version releases, right? So there are a bunch of corner cases that basically make it unusable. So a really simple way around that is just using git SVN and cron. So basically using git SVN to mirror and then launching, that out of, launching the mirroring stuff out of cron every few minutes. The cool thing about that is it gives us fast clones, so whenever you're interacting with the repository now to do a deploy, it's just a git clone, so it's very, very, very fast compared to SVN. Uh, it meant that we had commit access, so if we ever needed to go in and change something quickly or update a configuration file to do a deployment, we could do that. Um, and it's just 21st century technology. So that rounds out uh, repeatability. Next thing, visibility. So visibility is really all about keeping one eye on the past and one eye on the future. And technology-wise, I think I don't need to say anything more. Uh, Next thing is code changes here. We want to be able to see changes that are coming down the pipeline. So we want to know stuff that's happening at the application level or the configuration management level. Uh, monitoring as well uh, is vitally important for the visibility and reporting as well. So on the metric collection stuff, um, my metric collection tool of choice is CollectD. CollectD is a lightweight statistic collection daemon with an emphasis on collection. So you can think of it more actually as a platform for collecting time series data. So it's plugin based. The default uh, installation of CollectD has almost 100 plugins now that do all sorts of things like Apache, MySQL, um, low-level system statistics as well, like you know memory usage and that sort of thing. Um, it's network aware, so any of the data that you collect on a machine running CollectD can be piped someplace else on the network. So it's really great if you just want to have lightweight collectors on all your front-end machines that aren't writing out a lot of stuff to disk, but then forwarding it to a data collection server behind the scenes. Uh, and it's got fantastically well-defined APIs. So very well-defined API for writing plugins. There are also language bindings for Perl, Python, uh, something else as well. Um, and also the network, uh, the network API is very, very well-defined. Um, so it's very easy to write uh, network code that just talks to it. And it's all done using UDP. So one quick example of that is, uh, is curl JSON. Curl JSON is a plugin that you get with CollectD out of the box on most modern Linux distributions. So this is an example configuration here, and what, what it's doing is it's polling this particular URL uh, at a set interval, generally about 10 or 20 seconds, depending on how you configure it. And it's ripping, uh, so it, it's getting a whole bunch of JSON from that, and it's extracting different bits from different keys and whatnot. So this makes it really easy to instrument a whole bunch of statistics within your application. So for example, on your application, you just expose a URL or slash metrics, and then a bunch of other stuff underneath that if you want, if you want to have sub-URLs. And then Clay D can just talk to that, rip out those data, uh, rip out those bits of data, uh, and it just stores it internally like any other Clay D statistic. So in code changes, uh, application and config management is really what we're talking about here. So we want to be able to see changes of the code that are coming down the pipeline and stuff that's going to be deployed, and the configuration management changes that are progressing through the different environments as well. 
Um, I can't strongly recommend GitHub enough. Um, if you want something open source, there are plenty of other things out there as well. Um, the best thing about this, though, is uh, the news feed, which is really vitally important if you've got lots of disparate teams. If, if you can get a, a news feed for an organization, and you can basically see all the changes that are happening across all the different repositories. Uh, it's a really great way to keep an eye on what other people are doing and pick up errors and do code review and that sort of thing. So our monitoring, um, this is more of a, just an interesting quirk that we discovered. Um, we found that with Triple M uh, for managing a uh, MySQL cluster, uh, that it would actually block under high I.O. if you're running the Triple M control show. But, so the interesting thing about that is if your monitoring system is doing uh, you know, a Triple M control show behind the scenes, all of a sudden, your monitoring system will report, holy crap, my triple M cluster has disappeared entirely. But if you just connect to a socket and do a show and a quit, it works perfectly because everything's actually working perfectly behind the scenes. So obviously, the solution to that is just open up a socket. OK, last thing, uh, reporting. So reporting is really important um, from a managerial perspective, um, being able to know what, your, what changes are happening over time and how they're affecting the overall performance of the site. So one really simple example of that is uh, NK Query Digest and LogRotate. So NK Query Digest is from the MarkKit package. Basically, it's a MySQL slow query log analysis tool. So we had this run every day out of Cron, uh, sorry, out of, out of LogRotate. And what it would do is it would give us a ranked list of the slowest queries within, within, on the database. And it would send that to both the developers so they knew how to uh, tune the, so they knew what they could focus on to tune the queries. Uh, but it also sent it to us, the operations team as well, because we were able to see how we could actually tune MySQL behind the scenes to make it run faster for those slow queries. So, okay. Those are, the, those are the fundamental tenets. I'm just going to do a couple of really brief retrospectives uh, about different, different times that this sort of stuff came into play during the campaign. So one of the things, one of the events that happened was we had a slave explosion near the end of the campaign where we were taking the most donations. Um, what does that actually mean? Well, we had MySQL replication all being managed by Triple M, and there were two masters and four slaves. And they all had, the, the masters had floating IPs, and the slaves also had floating IPs as well. So we got a replication fail on one of the slaves. Um, it's not too uncommon. It happens occasionally with MySQL. Not a big problem. So we were down to three slaves in the cluster. Increase the cluster load, as you would expect. Um, so you know, obviously, if you've got a machine that's taken out of the cluster, the other three machines that are remaining are going to have to be doing a lot of work to play catch up with that. And then we noticed a replication delay on another slave, but only on one of the slaves, not on the other two. Quite interesting, quite curious. So they took us down to two nodes because Triple M will take that replication delay node out of the cluster. So we did a bit of an inspection on the replication delay slave because we wanted to know what was different about it that was causing this one to fall over that the other ones weren't. And we found that it was swapping like mad and it only had half the memory allocated to it. So that was pretty simple to fix. You know, you do a shutdown, you do an upgrade, you do a reboot, everything's fine, rejoins a cluster, not any problems at all. And we were able to do that really, really easily. You know, it, took, it, it took less than probably 20 minutes to be able to work that out um, because we had fantastic visibility over what was happening on that machine. You know, we were using CollectD here. We had metrics, so we knew that the machine was swapping like mad. Um, and we were, able to, we were able to use that data and just go, OK, well, we're having a swapping problem on this. Let's work out what's going to be memory related. Oh, yeah, you know, we've only got half the memory. Maybe we should fix that. And that's really a problem with consistency as well. You know, we've got fantastic consistency at the, uh, at the software level, but not necessarily at the virtual machine provisioning level. So it's sort of an interesting anecdote. OK, database connectivity. This is another incident that we had at the very beginning of the campaign when we were doing a soft launch. And we were noticing a whole bunch of PHP connection errors would happen randomly, and we couldn't work out why. And we found that the configuration file itself was parsing and loading. Everything seemed to be OK. but the application server still couldn't, talk, still couldn't talk to the database and were timing out. So what we did was we asked the developers to add a configuration dump URL uh, onto, onto the application so that we could look at how the configuration that's on the disk is being interpreted by the application and the application framework behind it as well. So that's really a way of increasing the visibility. You know, we, we, it, it doesn't really matter what is on the disk. What actually matters is what's happening with the configuration on disk and how it gets translated into something that's running in production. Right? So we're using something sort of similar to call JSON for that. It was sort of like a JSON dump. And we may have been able to plug that into, uh, into CollectD if we wanted as well. So after that, we did a redeploy. And we waited a bit. And we sort of looked. And then we discovered that there was a typo. So the interesting thing about that 
there were two reviewers of the configuration management system. So all about that visibility. We, you know, we, we knew all the stuff that was coming through. The person that was making the change knew what, was, what they were doing. And then we also had a reviewer as well that was looking at all that. Um, but both of those people in the operations team. Uh, and that's really, you know, that's really a visibility problem there. If we had better visibility of all the code changes, um, you know, if we were using something like the, uh, the newsfeed feature in GitHub, then perhaps we would have more reviewer diversity. You know, developers would be looking at the configuration changes that we're making in the ops team in relation to their application, and they'd be able to go, oh, hey guys, there's a typo here, maybe we should fix that before we go live. Um, the last thing is data consistency. So, in this particular case, uh, we're doing a new release of the application here, and there were a bunch of database migrations, so there was a, a new report that was being added to the application. And we have the standard release promotion uh, cycle where we take a release, we deploy it to a UAP, then if it passes there, it goes to stage and then to production. So in this particular case, pass a UAP, no problems at all. Then we did another deploy, went to stage, no problems at all there either. We went to production, holy crap, it exploded in our face. Anyway, that's just basically the worst case scenario where all your QA testing doesn't catch a bug that goes into production. So what's the thing that's different in all these different environments? Well, the configuration is the same because we've ensured consistency. We know that everything is repeatable because it's working the same in all those different environments, no errors. The thing that was actually different behind the scenes was the data, because the data in production, in the data, production database, wasn't being synced back to what was the stage and what was the new app. And in particular, the report, the first time it was being run, was doing a create table foo, which should have been a create table if not exists foo. And the interesting thing about there is we found that uh, the production environment, the database was initialized from a slightly different source than what the stage in the UAD environments were. Again, a problem with repeatability, right? And consistency. So the easy way to get around that was you take the, the production database and you send it back to stage. And then you take the stage and you send it back to UAD. Easy way, easy fix. And that's really all about repeatability. So hopefully I've sort of given you an overview about how you can implement DevOps at the technical level within your organization. You can take a lot of these ideas and extrapolate them. So just go over them one more time. Consistency, it's all about ensuring identical behavior within an environment or across multiple environments. Repeatability, so it's a function of consistency. We're about automating to remove human error uh, and decrease the feedback loops. And visibility, one eye on the past, one eye on the future. But there's one key point that I missed out. Communication. You know, if we didn't have any communication between all the different teams, if we weren't actively working on our communication, none of this stuff would have worked. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. So, if anybody has a question? Uh, do you have your uh, configuration someplace, the puppet configurations and whatnot? Uh, we take release publicly, or...? Yeah, why not? <laughs> That's a nice idea. Um, some of it, some of it has been released um, indirectly, but most of that stuff is secret source. Uh, especially the proprietary component stuff that I was talking about before. There's a lot of R&D that went into making that work correctly. A um, couple of quick comments. Firstly, there's, if you search for DevOps um, on the internet, there's some groups that are basically trying to put together the sort of repositories that you're talking about of this is how you would do a, a best practice and all of these things that you could then pick up on. Um, and secondly, for people who are interested in DevOps, we've got a couple of talks, and this is mid MiniConf, including one at the same time tomorrow um, by DevDAS, um, and you might want to come along to those as well. Yeah, the, the interesting thing about that, um is uh, you were, you're talking about best practices there, and I'm a firm believer that best practice is the enemy of innovation, right? You're basically saying there that with the best practice, we can't possibly ever get any better than that. You know, and that's absolutely impossible. You know, you're always going to be changing, always going to be improving. And you know, what I've sort of what I talked about here is you know these fundamental principles that we've applied to our environment um, and looked at ways that they work and ways that they do. Last question. The matter of comment, it's never best practice, it's always best current practice. Sure. They're good enough practices. <laughs> I mean, it can always be improved. This is the best we know right now. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Thank you. Um,